Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's Career Coaches webinar, Pivoting to a Better Career Fit with Leadership Development Facilitator and Career Coach, Emily Bags. My name is Joseph Blancas and I serve as an Associate Director for Alumni Career Engagement at UCLA Alumni Affairs. In today's program, Emily will share actionable steps so that you can find that better career fit. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank our Alumni Association sustaining donors. It's with your help that we are able to strengthen the Bruin community with career programs like this. For some general webinar housekeeping, we'll have time at the end of our program for a Q&A with Emily. So please use the Q&A function below to submit your questions and not the chat. We will also be recording the event and we'll share it out in a follow-up email once the recording is available. Now to start our program, I'm excited to introduce Emily Bax. Emily is an experienced, compassionate career counselor and coach who enjoys helping people figure out how their strengths can benefit the world. Many of her clients are early to mid-career professionals, parents returning to work, or successful professionals looking for something more. She has supported the career development of students and alumni at the University of San Diego Career Development Center for more than 20 years. She received a master's degree in counseling with an emphasis in career counseling from USD and a bachelor's degree in women's studies from UCLA. I'll turn it over to Emily to start our program. Emily, thank you for being here. Great, thank you so much, Joseph. And welcome Bruins, it's great to be back I'm working with the Alumni Association. We are going to be talking about career pivoting today. So in just this very kind introduction of me in my bio, you can hear that I do a lot of work in different settings with people around them. The main questions people bring to me as a career coach is, how do I find something I like better? How do I switch to another job? And that's why I love this topic so much. We are going to be looking today at some different ways that you can figure out that next step. So that, that's the piece that I really like looking at. The goal is for you to leave with some action steps, some things that you can actually start doing right now. I'm assuming you're all here at this webinar because you're considering a career change or some type of switch into a different role. We'll have some time toward the very end, right before we ask questions. I'm going to have you try to identify something that you want to work on next. So we're going to be really action focused and figuring out what that next step could look like. There's so many topics that I love um, around this particular pivot topic, but I want to start with a definition. So Jenny Blake wrote a book called Pivot that really it, it's about uh, making a career change like this. And she defines a pivot as a pivot is a change you make of your own volition when you have reached a point in your career when you're ready for increased challenge and impact. Now, I love that definition because it really looks at growth. So what can we be doing differently? When we talk about a pivot, we're often talking about switching an industry or role, trying something very different in our career. But the exercises that we look at today can also be applied if you're just looking for a new environment taking a very similar role, similar industry, but you're just looking for that next step. Here's an outline of what we're gonna be doing today. Um, we're gonna try to answer these three questions. What do you wanna do next? How can you get there? And what will you do first? Now, to be totally clear, we're not gonna actually answer all those questions today, but we're gonna look at exercises that can help you answer those. What do you wanna do next? So this, again, is the reason that people come to me as a career counselor or a career coach. This, I think, is the really challenging part, is figuring out what is that next thing. I want to make sure you understand how normal this is. This is really a challenging part of our careers. Most people don't just know automatically what they want to do um, or what they want to do next. And there's no really easy, clear roadmap for that. I don't know if any of you had that experience in college or earlier where somebody could just tell you what you're going to do next. Um, most of us have to really try things out to figure it out. And that's true throughout your career. The kinds of exercises that we're gonna look at today, some of them are gonna be a little more inward focused and looking that way, and others are gonna be more outward focused. All of these exercises are ways to collect some more information to help you know what you want next. And really the goal is what psychologist um, Ken Sheldon calls self-concordance. And that means doing work that is more 
in alignment with your true self and with your values. So that's really what we're going to be looking at as we go through. This next quote that I have illustrates this really well, I think. Joseph Campbell said, we must be willing to get rid of the life we planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. This is a quote I've used throughout my career because I really think it helps illustrate that idea of figuring out what we want, our values, versus just doing the things that we've been told we should do or that we think we should do and being able to sort that out. The exercises that we're going to look at next are really going to help with that. So that's really my goal is to help you figure out with the information you have now, starting where you are right now, how can we use that information and how can we build on it to look at what comes next? So as I mentioned, one of the ways that we can get clarity is by looking inside, some doing some inner work. And I have a couple of exercises for you here. This one, asking your subconscious, also comes from Ken Sheldon. And the, the way that this works is where you consciously think about a particular question, like what do I want next in my career? And then let it go, go do something else. So I have this described here as the, the idea came to me in the shower technique, which you may have experienced before. Your subconscious keeps working on problems that you have when you're not consciously focused on it. And sometimes those best ideas come to us when we're taking a walk or doing something totally different. I should tell you too, all of these exercises that I share with you today, I have on a handout. Um, and at the end of my prepared slides, you're going to have the opportunity to put in your email address so that I can send you the handout. So don't go crazy trying to take notes and, and write all of this down. You don't need to. I'm going to send it to you. I'm also going to send you the different people I reference, like Ken Sheldon. Um, he was interviewed on a podcast episode of Hidden Brain that I think is really helpful, and I'll include that in my handout as well. All right, the next exercise, uh, it's really two parts. Journaling or reflecting on questions. This is something I use with my clients all the time. And one exercise that I recommend is just describing your ideal day. Now, some people say, well, if I could do that, I wouldn't be here working with a career coach. I would know what I, I want. And I'd be moving forward to it. So I say, break this down into smaller steps. You may not know what you want to do next, but you do have some ideas of what you like and don't like. And that's the goal of this exercise is to get down to that. So if I say, describe your ideal day, you may not know what that job is, but you might be able to say, my ideal day, I would not be at a desk all day long. Um, or I would be working with people more and not so much with data or whatever that might look like for you. Um, think about who you're working with, what you're working with, what your schedule might be like, um, what kind of impact you might be having. Any of these questions will help you get to a description of an ideal day or closer to an ideal day for you. There's a second part to this exercise as well, though. After you've written that, go away from it a while, come back. I recommend then to look through and think of all these qualities I wrote down, which of these are essential to my happiness and which are just preferred. So that activity can really help you start getting at those values and what you might want out of your next role. Another journaling prompt that I like to use is really just looking at where you are right now. So if you're looking to change, something is not perfect about your current role. So start writing down, what are the pros and cons? What do you like about your role? What don't you like? What's missing? Because sometimes there's nothing wrong with your role, it's fine. It's just that something's missing. What are you longing for, right? What are these different pieces? This is a way for you to, again, start getting some data on paper to figure out what it is that you want next. This is really important. Uh, I know I've already been talking for a while about figuring out what's next, but Often my clients come to me and um, when they don't know what's next, they'll say, well, here's what I've done so far. Like I've been a teacher. What else can we do with this? Like, how can we take this experience and turn it like, what else can I be with that? That's a really limiting view. So when somebody comes to me and says that, I'm like, put that aside. Here's what I want you to think about. What do you like? Right. What do you what do you want? Let's figure out what you want. And then we'll look at what the pathway is from where you are now to where that want, where you want to be. That's a much more expansive view. Um, and it also ties into this idea that it's much easier or more positive to be headed towards something rather than just running away from something. So that's part of why we're gonna 
looking at all, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at all these exercises to figure out what that next step is. All right, third way of looking inward is with assessment tools. Now, some of you may have taken assessments in the past, either in college or in your current job or past jobs. I like to use assessment tools in my work as a career coach because it helps people get some ideas or language around different aspects of their personhood. So one of the tools I use is Gallup's Clifton Strengths. It used to be called Strengths Finder. Uh, that's a tool I particularly like to use with people who are returning to the workplace after a break. So maybe a parent who's been home caring for a child for a while. Um, it's a way to look at what are these strengths that permeate your life, probably permeate it so deeply that you don't even notice these strengths. So it's a way to really start identifying and owning the strengths that you have. Another tool that I like to use is the strong interest inventory that looks more at interests. So it's not looking at ability. It's just saying, what do you like? It asks a bunch of questions about what you like and then compares your answers to people in different occupations to give you an idea of kind of like where your people might be. Where else do people who have those same interests enjoy working? A third tool I use is the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, the MBTI. Um, it's frequently used in the workplace as well. None of these tools are used as a crystal ball. It's not going to say, oh, you're this personality type, you should do this job. Instead, it's saying, if you can identify what some of those personality preferences are, it's going to help you start to see what you value in the workplace and where might be a more natural fit for you. So those are some of the ways that I use more self-reflective work. Um, but let's look at some exercises that are more about the outer world as well. This is another one of my favorite exercises that I use with clients, and it's called browsing for jobs. And what it is, is exactly what it sounds like. Take the pressure off looking at jobs or uh, job listings. We're not looking to find a job for you to apply to today. It's really just trying to see what pops out to me. What do I like? And this is surprisingly difficult for many people. The goal of this exercise is to start identifying what you like, what appeals to you versus what you think you should do. And I talked a little bit about self-concordance and shoulds versus what you like. Uh, I find too in my high achieving clients, which probably all of you fall into if you went to UCLA, um, it can be even more difficult because there is such a focus on doing the, the right thing to get to a particular goal. You all had to do certain things in high school to get into UCLA, right? They may not have been the things you liked, but they were the things that you should do and you got them done. Uh, at this point in your career, I wanna start unraveling that a little more. How can we get more in alignment with your authentic self? What do you actually like? So this exercise is about looking through, seeing what appeals and telling the practical voice to please be quiet for a little while. And the practical voice might be the one that's like, oh, that job's in Dallas, I'm not gonna move to Dallas. It's okay, we're not looking for a job to actually apply to, we're just looking at what's appealing. Um, sometimes you might look at something and think that's not practical, it doesn't make sense. That's okay, we're just getting used to the idea of figuring out what you like. Another activity that we can do is tapping into the people around you, right? So asking your inner circle, people who know you well, what do they picture you doing? Maybe you already have family members or friends who say, oh, you should do this job, you'd be great at it. Um, now, I'm not saying that you're going to let your inner circle dictate your next move. Instead, they're pro providing you some data from a different perspective. And what I really want to look at is how do you react to that? So both of my parents are teachers, retired teachers now. But when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do um, when I was in school, they both suggested teaching because I loved it. They're like, what about teaching? Well, you'd be great at it. So that was a suggestion for me, but my reaction to it was like, Ugh, that's not quite right for me. So that gave me the opportunity to unpack and kind of pull apart. Well, what about teaching isn't right? And what is really starting to identify again, what do I want? So the opportunity here is get the perspective of somebody else and then unpack it through your own lens. This next one is similar. And it's using AI. I don't know how many of you have been playing around with ChatGPT. I've had a lot of fun with it the past couple of weeks, looking at it with a career lens in mind. So one of the things I do is you've collected all this information from these different activities and journal prompts and things we've talked about, but you still don't know what the job is. 
see what ChatGPT suggests. Um, so I've been putting things like, what jobs include these skills and qualities? And then I put a list, see what comes up. Again, this is not a crystal ball and it's not perfect, but it's an idea generator for you then to respond to. So take a look. You may see some interesting jobs that you've thought of before, some interesting jobs you haven't thought of before. I'm almost sure that you're going to see some jobs that you're like, absolutely not. But it's a way for you to start looking at options and seeing what may come next. All right. Once you've done those different activities, you've generated some ideas, you have um, some thoughts about what you want to do next, the next stage is really testing those ideas. Um, Ken, Ken Sheldon calls this verification. So he says, not every aha moment is going to be the best insight or best fit. So we want to take those insights or ideas and test them against reality as a way uh, for you to figure out whether or not they're a great fit for you. One of the easiest ways to do this is just with online research. So doing some data collection, um, let's look into some of those jobs that might be appealing to you. Some of you may already use Glassdoor. If you're not familiar with this website, it's similar. I think of it as Yelp for the workplace. So you can start looking at insider perspectives, like any crowdsourced information, take it with a grain of salt, right? Um, but you can start to gather some information about company culture or what it's like in a particular job. I also recommend people look for other information online, blogs or articles that people have written on LinkedIn. Maybe you're interested, for example, in being a project manager. See if you can find a project manager online who writes about their day-to-day -day work or challenges that come up for them. And then this last one here on the list, ONET. That um, ONET and the Occupational Outlook Handbook are government resources that provide a lot of really interesting data about specific industries. I, mean, I have links to those in the handouts. So you can take a look at those. But this is a way for you just to start collecting some information to um, add to the ideas that you're getting. Now, this next one is my absolute favorite way to collect data, and that is through informational interviews. So informational interviews, they're also called career conversations. It's just talking to somebody in a job that sounds interesting to you. So finding out um, what's your typical day like? You're not going to reach out to somebody and say, can you get me a job? Because that'd be awkward for you and for them. But you can reach out to somebody and say, hey, I see that you're working in um, marketing. I'm really interested in just learning more about that. Can I set up a 30 minute conversation with you just to hear about what it is you do? Now, I recommend that you start with your own network. If you have anybody in the field that you are interested in, either a family member or a friend, great. You can certainly start there. But I like to assume that my clients know no one in the field that they're interested in. So what I'm going to show you are a couple of different resources on how to find people for these informational interviews, particularly with using your UCLA network. So some of you know uh, and may already use the website called UCLA One, which I'm going to pull up on my screen here. UCLA One is a platform provided uh, through the Alumni Association for us to be able to connect with each other. So with this, um, you can see I'm here in the directory section and we've got about 60,000 registered users. These are people who have already listed themselves on UCLA one So let's see who we might wanna talk to. On this filter section over here, um, you can look at, I have this open already, but looking at get involved. If you click this, you can see who is offering help. Now, the kind of help that we are looking for is career pivot advice, um, or you could say informational interview, right? And so maybe what you have identified is that you're interested in working in the biotech field. So let's come down a little bit further. If you go under work experience, you can select an industry. Once I select that, um, you can see over on the left, We've gone from 60,000 people to 85 registered users who fit those criteria that I just selected. I'm just going to click on the first person here. Um, when we click on Jason's profile, you can see there's a button where you can message them directly and reach out and say, hey, I'd love to talk to you about this field. So uh, I know that uh, Sarah and Joseph are going to share the link for UCLA One, and you can also get more instructions on that too. But I strongly recommend that you sign up for this. It's a fantastic resource provided to us. 
One other tool I wanted to share with you though is LinkedIn. So clicking over here to LinkedIn, I like to use the alumni search feature to find more people in my field. When I click up on the search bar, I wanna pick UCLA um, and that takes me to the UCLA main page. You'll see here, there's a tab called alumni. When I click on that, it's gonna pull up all half a million people on LinkedIn who say they have a degree from UCLA. And this can be any degree, by the way, undergrad, grad, professional, they're all um, included here. And there's a lot of ways that you can narrow this down. You can throw in a keyword right here. Um, maybe you only wanna to talk to recent graduates. You can search uh, by these years here. You can add that in. Most of the parameters I use are right here. I wanna look at where they work, a specific company, and you can click this add button to look for a search for a particular company. I can look by geographic region, but if I go to the next screen, I can also look at functional area, their skills, or their major. So what they studied um, or how we're connected. So to stick with my uh, biotech theme, I'm gonna say, let's say I'm interested in working for BD. So if I pick that company, you can see I've got 62 alums now who work at BD. I could further narrow that down by geographic region, but let's say I'm interested in engineering. So I pick the engineers, that gets me down to 13 people, and that's a more reasonable number for me to look through. So you can come down here at these kind of cards of each of the people. You can click on it to go to their profile and read more. Um, I'm just gonna pick this person here at the top. Uh, if you read through this person's profile and they look like somebody that might be helpful for you to talk to or have an informational interview with, just hit this connect button. If you do it from this screen, from um, the desktop version, not the mobile site, a box will pop up giving you 300 characters to explain yourself basically. And that's where you can say, I'm a fellow Bruin. I'm really interested in hearing more about BD. It's, it's part of what I'm exploring for my next career move. Can we set up a time to talk for 30 minutes? I'd love to hear about your role. So just make it really clear, let them know the connection, let them know uh, what it is that you want from them so that they are very clear on what they're you know, answering. And that's an opportunity for you to collect more information so that you can test your idea. And you're gonna hear me talk about informational interviews a little bit more uh, because I really do love them. I think it's one of the most effective ways to collect information and to, to conduct a job search. All right, back to our regularly scheduled programming here with slides. Um, you're still testing your ideas. You've collected data online. You've talked to some people. Another way that you can consider a new role is through really formal learning. So take a class. I'm um, going back to my project manager example. If you think project management is something you want to do, maybe you want to take one of the classes toward a PMP certificate um, just to try it out and see if you like it. You can also do informal learning. And this is something that I encourage people to be doing all the time in their career, really working toward new goals. If you found an idea that you want to test out, is there a way you can do a project in your current role um, to add to that skill, but also to kind of try it out? If not, maybe you could do it somehow in a volunteer capacity or somehow working in a different organization or even maybe shadowing somebody, visiting somebody at their workplace. How, these are all just different ways where you can try to collect more information. You're never going to have a perfect decision, and that's okay. Every part of your career is just making the best decision you have with the information you have at the time. And this is these all of these here listed on the slide are just different ways to get more information so that you can make a better informed decision. All right, that got us through some of the different ways I look at trying to figure out what comes next. This next section is how do you get there? So this it leads us really straight to job search techniques. The first thing that I recommend you do is a gap analysis. And so what a gap analysis is, is let's say you've identified what that role is, that next job that you wanna have, look at that job description and see what's missing. What do I need to do to connect where I am now to that new role? And a lot of those tests and ways to test those ideas that were on the last slide are often the same kinds of things that you need to do to bridge that gap. So maybe it's adding to some type of formal learning or certification. It could be gaining experience through volunteer or doing project work. There's different ways to try to bridge that gap so that you are qualified for that next role that you want. This you've probably heard a million times and I'm gonna say it again, you wanna tailor your materials. 
If you have been working in one particular field, your resume looks a certain way. If you're trying to move into a different role or a different field, you're going to need to make some changes to the language. Look at those job descriptions. What skills are they asking for? Make sure that you are illustrating and highlighting those skills wherever you've used them in your current role so that you can move forward and make it easy for the person at the other end to see how you're qualified, how you're going to be able to come in and solve their problems. This is another one that I've been having fun with ChatGPT, and I totally recommend people try this one because it's just really interesting. Um, in ChatGPT, I'll put a prompt, something like, write a 125 to 175 word summary um, or about section for LinkedIn using my resume with a focus on project management. And then you drop in your resume. It is so interesting to see some of the different things that come out. Now, I'm not saying I want you to use the writing that ChatGPT does as your final draft, not at all. This is just an idea generator and a way to kind of see what keywords come up, what are the ways that are highlighted um, when, when looking at the ChatGPT responses, and you can keep generating more as well to, to get some to compare and contrast. But that has been a fun way for me too, even, or don't give it the parameter of saying using this skill, just say write, the, write a summary of my resume. It's going to let you see what's emphasized in your resume. What are, what are other people seeing? Another tool that I like to use to help people tailor their material, and again, this is um, on my handout, it's a website called jobscan.co, so .co, not .com. And the free version lets you do this, I think, three or five, five times a month. Um, no need to do the paid version unless you really want to. But you can drop in your resume and a job description and it will give you feedback on whether or not you're hitting those key uh, skills or ideas. It's similar to the technology that's used in applicant tracking systems. So it's a way to let you see how is your resume gonna be received at the other end. Lastly, and I think most importantly, I want you to diversify your job search as much as possible by connecting with human beings. So certainly the online job search is gonna be part of your search. You're gonna look for jobs online and apply online. But the response rate for that can be really low, no matter how perfect your materials are. And that can be super discouraging and take away your motivation for the job search. I call it soul crushing because I really feel like the online job search is soul crushing. This is where I'm going to have you go back to those informational interviews. Talk to people. Um, you're Again, you're not asking them for a job. You're just asking to hear about their career or their field. But what happens often in those conversations is people connect with you. You become a human being, not just a piece of paper, which is very important when you're trying to switch into a new field as well. You need somebody who can see your strengths, um, somebody who sees you as a person. Again, not that the person, the informational interview person is going to hire you, but they may have some ideas for you. They may offer another person for you to talk to. They can help you tap into a different type of job search that can be a much better return on investment than just applying online. I'm happy to take questions about any of this too, by the way, when we get to that, that point. But I really wanna talk quickly about next steps as well. You can learn and think about this all you want and reflection is a big part of the job search, but we also need to have action. So I'm gonna pull up, this is just a list of 10 of the different action steps that I mentioned today. I'm gonna to give you 60 seconds of silence to read these and pick which one you wanna start with and jot it down for yourself. All right, looking at that step that you chose, what is the next smallest step that you can take toward that? Like for example, an informational interview, you're not gonna be able to launch into that the minute this webinar is over. Maybe the next smallest step is to create an account in UCLA One. Take a moment to think about your next smallest step. And when will you do that step? Pick a time, pick a day. A lot of my work as a career coach is focusing on action and helping others. We work together on reflection and then also on action. Accountability is huge, right? Most people will do work when they feel accountable. I want you to figure out how you're gonna stay on task with this pivot that you are considering. 
So do you need to add it to your calendar? Do you want to block time in? Is that helpful to you? Do you use a to-do list or a task list or Trello or something like that where you're going to keep track? Would it be more helpful for you to have a separate tracking system like using the teal extension through um, Chrome as a way of tracking where you're applying or do you need to set up a spreadsheet? And lastly, and I think this can be one of the most important things, who's going to help you feel accountable? So certainly, like I said, working with a career coach is one way to do that. That's not always in people's budget when they're making a switch, and that's fine too. Find a friend who's also working toward a goal. Pick a colleague, pick someone, and have regular check-in meetings. You will be amazed at the difference it makes when you know that next Wednesday you're going to have to tell someone whether or not you did the thing that you said you were going to do last Wednesday. So I really encourage you to find different ways to keep yourself accountable, and it really helps with motivation as you're making a big change, like doing a pivot. All right, this next slide here, I've got my QR code, um, and also Sarah's going to drop in the chat the link to get to this. It's a very simple form, this QR code. It's just going to have your name and your email address. It's a way for me to collect your email so that I can send you the key slides and the summary of the exercises that I talked about today. My key takeaway is as you pivot, I want you to focus on progress and the process, not on perfection. Right? Our career is never perfect. The next move is never going to be perfect. The next role is never going to be perfect. And that's okay. It's really continuing to collect information, collect data so that you can continue to refine and get a step closer um, in your career to what you might want to do next to be more in, in self-concordance, having that sense of being authentically in a job that you really value and enjoy. Um, my references are in there, so somebody watching the video later can see those. Um, and I am ready to move into questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can invite Joseph back on. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting such great feedback in the chat over how great uh, uh, content this is as far as just the actionable steps and kind of just providing a digestible way of approaching and pivoting a career. Um, I'm so glad it's helpful. Yeah, to everyone, um, while we transition to the Q&A portion, if you have any for Emily, please include them in the Q&A uh, function below. But we also did throw into the chat our program feedback survey. So while you're thinking of those questions and you have some time, please take a few short minutes to fill out the survey that information you will provide will really help us to determine future professional development programs from our career coaches network. So uh, again, if you have questions for Emily, throw those into the chat and we will um, start uh, addressing those time permitting. Um, I did get a question in the chat um, from an attendee and she had asked, what was the website that compares your resume to job descriptions called? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's going to be in the handout that I sent, but I'll tell you right now, it's called job scan, say J-O-B-S-C-A-N dot C-O. So that's the one confusing part. It's not dot com, it's dot co. So job scan. Awesome. So all the, mm -hmm. all the resources you mentioned will be in the um, PDFs that you're going to send out once they right. subscribe via the QR code form. So please do that if you want all of the awesome resources that have been shared out uh, today. Um, to start off with a question, uh, which we got in our registration, but I imagine people are filling it. Um, I think the idea of pivoting or leaving what's comfortable can be scary. You gave us a lot of great actionable steps, but what advice would you give for those who are feeling anxious about a career pivot and all the emotions that can come with the uncertainty? What this question writer brought up is a really, really common issue and something that I usually start with, right? You know, kind of figuring out the emotions behind a change. Any change in a career can bring up, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, obviously getting laid off is a whole, people expect for that to be really difficult, but self-generated change can be really challenging as well. And these fears are common. So there's a couple of different ways that I approach that with my clients. And one is to acknowledge, to like normalize that it's, it's difficult and confusing and scary. 
and another to like practice stepping forward, even though it is scary. So one of the ways that we can do that is to reflect on why this person wants to make a change. If we can focus on the why, that really often gives the courage and the power to keep moving forward. So depending on how powerfully this person uh, desires the change or wants the change, sometimes we need to spend some time there to really clarify those changes, uh, the reasons for the change in order to get past the scary feelings. Um, and then sometimes too, we've got to manage imposter syndrome as we get into that new role. But again, that looking at strengths and really validating from past experience can be really helpful there. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, we got a couple questions in the Q&A around the assessments that you shared. I know, um, can you repeat what those three were and whether or not they are free? <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, none of them are free. <laughs> so I'm just going to start right there, but I will name a free one for you. So Gallup Clifton, Gallup Clifton Strengths is one. It used to be called Strengths Finder. That one you can purchase on your own. I think it's $20 for the top five reports. So it's pretty affordable. Um, the other two assessments, the Strong Interest Inventory and the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, the publisher requires them to be interpreted by a certified practitioner like me. So that those you have to usually go through a coach to do those. Um, there is another strengths assessment online that is free, I believe called the VIA Character Strengths Assessment. Uh, I don't use that one, but I've, I've heard about it. If I've said the name wrong, forgive me, but um, I know there are some free strengths assessments out there that are pretty helpful. Great, thank you for that. Um, George asked, and I feel like this is more of a question for the Alumni Association, uh, if, the webinar is going to be recorded. Yes, it'll be recorded and we will share it out in a follow-up email to all um, registrants. So you will get that. It'll take about a week or two. So just look out for that email, George. Uh, another attendee asked, what, did, what would be your advice for someone who is making a pivot due to a layoff? So not voluntarily. Yeah. Okay. So layoff, it, it's, the main thing I, when I'm working with clients or people who've been laid off is you've got to recognize and spend a little bit of time in that grief stage. So really being okay with the fact that your emotions are probably more than you expected them to be. It doesn't mean anything's wrong with you. You don't need to rush through that. Um, but instead spending some time really grieving that loss, um, whatever it means for you to be upended in that way. So I usually will spend some time there and just be like, you're going to have to feel those feelings. Um, from that point, we have to kind of do a postmortem on the role that you left because you may have been really happy in your job and everything was great about it. So it may be less of a pivot and more of like, I just need to go try to find a new job that's in this area. But other times when people get laid off, they're like, you know, I was never going to leave that job because it was really comfortable. But now that I have to, I think I do want to make a change in terms of either the role or the industry or whatever that might be. And then a lot of these similar techniques um, are what you're going to do. I would just say, again, going back to that, that involuntary job change, with a layoff, feel the feelings, spend some time digging into your strengths and your past accomplishments, because often a layoff, um, even though it is not performance-based, feels performance-based, and it can be a real blow to people's self, sense of self-worth. So I, I like to spend a little bit of time there because then you kind of have that strength and readiness to do all the things that you know how to do to go get a new job. Thank you. Um, is there a, is it helpful to submit an optional cover letter for online job postings or are they actually um, being read by recruiters? Interesting question. That is such a great question. Because <laughs> the only answer is at the other end. So this is a question I ask recruiters frequently. So I, I'm lucky that I get to interact with recruiters fairly often. And I'm I'm I try not to just say what I think is true and instead try to collect some data from outside. I have some recruiters who say they just do not ever read cover letters. Okay. I have other recruiters who I've talked to who've said that they always read the cover letter and they read the cover letter before the resume. So that's no help for you specifically. I can tell you, it seems like in the tech world, there's less interest in cover letters. Um, the more high touch the role is, there tends to be a little more interest in a cover letter. I think if you are making a genuine pivot, like leaving one industry and role and moving to another, a cover letter gives you one more page to explain that difference or that switch. 
and why you're going to do great in that new role. So my general rule with cover letters is the, the amount of time you spend on cover letters should be directly proportional to how much you want that role. So if you find your dream job, it's perfect, it's everything you always wanted, then yes, let's send a cover letter to give one more page to explain why. Um, if it's a job you're just applying to and it's like, yeah, it's, it's okay, maybe you don't have time to write that cover letter for every single job. Yeah, because it, it, it does take time and, and you should approach it with a tailored approach, right? So yeah. we don't want to burn out during the job search. You, no. you still have to like be able to balance your time. Mm -hmm. uh, another question was around um, people who have, you know, taken time off because of raising children. So what would your advice be um, for those who have been out of the workforce for five plus years and want to pivot back? Yeah. So again, one of my favorite populations to work with um, when I have parents who are returning to work, there's often the sense, and this may or may not be true for the question writer, but there's a sense of like, who's going to want to hire me? Like, I don't know how to do anything. There's this over, over exaggeration of what the break means in their career. So again, but our time together, I spend a lot with figuring out what is that next thing you want to do? What's the gap analysis? Um, because maybe you want to go back into a role very similar to what you did five years ago. Okay, then our approach is going to be pulling out, talking about relevant projects, really focusing on your ability. Um, or sometimes people are like, I've been gone for 15 years and I want a totally new job. I want this job over here, which is different from what I did before I had kids. Well, maybe they're going to do that. Their gap analysis helps them see, okay, I actually need a graduate degree or a new certification to do this new role that I want to do. And if that fits with our life, great. And if it doesn't, then we say, okay, what's option B? What are some of the next things we can do? But the key work that I do there, I think I spend a lot of time with helping people see their strengths, the fact that their experiences, both before they stayed home and while they stayed home can be really valid. On a very, very practical level, I encourage people to see how can you gain some experience right now? Um, similar to that, that slide I had that talked about taking a class, doing a project, doing a volunteer work, take on a tiny freelance project for a friend, um, something so that you have a current project or something to put on your resume and to talk about in an interview. I could talk about parents returning to work for a long time, but I'll just leave it there. <laughs> that might be our next uh, webinar with you. <laughs> hey, happy to do it. Um, great. Another question we have is um, your advice on showing someone you're interested in work are interested in a job with them or working with them without asking them directly for a job, what would be the best approach for that? Yeah, again, I, I try to be sincere and genuine. So um, if you are setting up like an informational interview or talking with somebody, I think it's fine to say, I'm really interested in X industry or whatever the company is that they're working for. And I'm trying to gather, you know, just some more information to help me to verify this interest, I'd love to hear more about your typical day or what do you like about working for this company or this culture, whatever it is. With an informational interview, I say, I would say aim for the first two thirds of your time to be asking about them. People love to talk about themselves and their jobs, right? They're going to want to tell you all that information. And toward the last third, that's where you can move toward advice. So you can say something like, what suggestions do you have for someone like me who is looking to transition into this industry? Or is there anyone else you recommend I talk to? So depending on how the conversation flows and how it goes, it may be really appropriate at the end for you to say, wow, this is super exciting to me. Um, I am going to look at open positions in this role or in this company. And, you know, I think I'm going to be looking toward applying. And that opens the door for that person to then say, oh, if you do, be sure to put me down as a reference. I get $100 if you get hired, <laughs> you know, or... Um, Oh, great. If you're interested, if you're applying, let me know and I'll look at your resume or I'll, I'll send an email to the hiring manager or whatever. It gives them a chance to offer help without you having to directly be like, can, I, can you help me get a job? So that that tends to be how I try to handle it in a diplomatic way that that makes it comfortable for the other person. I feel like at the end of the day, we've all been there. So, you know, but it really is about the approach. Yeah. Thank People you. People really want to help. That's yeah. the other thing I find people want to help. Mm -hmm. And what I hear over and over when I ask alumni or people, you know, oh, can I send somebody to you to talk to you? They say one of two things. They say, 
oh my gosh, I would love to talk to somebody and help them because somebody helped me. Mm-hmm. Or they say, oh my gosh, I would love to talk to somebody and help them because nobody helped me. Because nobody, yes, exactly. So kind of either <laughs> way, people want to offer that help. Yeah. Um, we have a question from a, another attendee. Um, you know, in today's world, there's a lot of people working from home. Some love it, some don't. Um, and this person asked, do you think, you know, having worked from home and working from home for such a long period of time, are they going to lose skills? Uh, they're concerned around, you know, going back to work in person, um, how that would be for them, uh, given that mm-hmm. they've been working from home. So is the question, um, if I work from home, will I lose skills? hmm you know, I think that that I'd, I'd want to dig into that a little bit more too. Yeah. But I would say, I think we've seen that the world runs wonderfully remotely. <laughs> um, you know, for most roles, right? I mean, obviously, there's some roles that have to be in person. But I would say, if you are concerned about your growth when you're working remotely, always have a plan. You know, work with your manager. Figure out what is your next growth step. Even if you're in the same job for five years, I want you to always have something that you're learning, right? As a career coach or career counselor, I'm like, that's part of what brings us joy often in our work is learning something new, stretching just beyond our boundaries. So look at what those those skills are that you can be continuing to grow. Now, if the concern is more of like, gosh, I don't even know how to talk to people anymore because that, you know, that's the skill that I've lost. That's something... Uh, more personal. And again, figure out what, what is exactly is the part that I've lost or that I'm worried about losing, break it down as specifically as you can. Cause if you just say communication skills, I don't know what that means, but if you're like, I don't know how to start a conversation with somebody I don't know anymore. Okay. That gives you something very specific to work toward, um, and a skill, a very specific skill to develop. So I hope that answers your question, but I think It really depends on the role, but I I personally think that you can keep your skills up to date when you're working remotely. You have to make an effort to make sure that Mm -hmm. you know what's needed in your role, what's happening in your industry, and are you gaining those skills? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, We had a question from an attendee around, uh, I'm just going to read it. Uh, As a director, storyteller, looking for greater fulfillment. Are there industry-specific sites to look for to browse outside of the entertainment industries? I don't know what else is out there. To ponder moving into having worked in the theater industry for 15 plus years, how or where do I find places to browse? Yeah. So this leads to that idea of how do I take what I have and take it into a new area, environment, or audience? Where can I bring that? So for browsing, I mean, maybe even just looking at a really general broad site at first, like looking at LinkedIn, for example, something like that, their job listing sites, and see what you're drawn toward. Because then that just doing that alone might help you see like, okay, I like of, of theater, but now I see that I'm I'm pulling toward this particular industry. Like I really seem to be, a you know, something working with kids is really appealing to me. Or agency work sounds really interesting. Then we can start looking for very specific sites within those interest areas. Excuse me. So that would be one way that I would approach that. But this might be another really fun one for chat GPT too. Um, What other industries use these skills? And drop in your current resume or your job description, see what industries come up. And again, that's a chance for you to evaluate because some things might come up that you're like, absolutely not, no way, I'm not interested in that. But that helps you start to put some boundaries around the whole wide world of where you might go next. It's like, okay, well, I know it's not over here. and I know it's not this. So let me start looking at these. Great. Thank you. I hope that helped answer your question uh, to the the person who asked it. Um, I think this is another great run, uh, given given your experience working with recruiters. What recommendations do you have for preparing for maybe a 15 to 20 minute call with the recruiter? You know, prepare my pitch, choose a few experiences to talk about in depth. Uh, what would be your advice? Yeah, so those quick screening calls, if it's with a, like the recruiter who's trying to see, should I move you on to the hiring manager? It's really going to be about, do you fit those key qualities? 
you know, can you do the job as listed? What I recommend is try to figure out, and this is true for any interview, what three to five things do you really want this person to know about you when the conversation is over? So it could be your experience. It could be your education. It could be a personal quality. I don't know, but pick what those things are and then identify some stories that illustrate those qualities or skills or whatever they are. Um, that's going to provide you almost like an outline for your interview. So if somebody says, tell me about yourself, which is like the hardest question ever because it's so open-ended, you don't have to be like, saying, oh, I have an older brother and I grew up playing tennis or, you know, whatever. Tell me about yourself is so broad. Instead, you know, tell me about yourself is going to be you answering, talking about those three to five key qualities, skills, or experiences you want them to know about. Um, it's a way to structure the content of your interview as you move through. And again, which three to five things? It's going to be really tailored to their needs and their job description. Great, thank you so much. And we're gonna ask one final question before we have to close out for uh, the afternoon. Um, and this is around, so there's, you know, the mental kind of barrier that you have to cross when um, deciding to pivot, but then there's also kind of other individuals that you need to think about like your family. So this person is asking, how do you handle telling your family you wanna leave a higher paying job to, something that maybe isn't making you as much money um, and how do you go about having that conversation when this change affects more than just yourself but also those who you're supporting uh adulthood right like this <laughs> it's just it's not fun uh, i see career progression life progression growing up my kind of overall view of that is how can I become more in alignment with my authentic self? How can I be more the person that I feel like I am versus who I feel I should be? So with when you're looking at something like changing out into a job that pays less, um, when that's going to affect other people, again, a lot of reflection and clarification for yourself, I think is a first step. So really understand what is this change I want to make? Why do I want to make this change? What are the aspects? How does this impact my life? How does it impact other people's lives? And when I say this, I don't mean just changing into a lower paying job, maybe your current role. How does this mismatch between your current role um, and your life impact your life, your experience, your happiness, their experience, their happiness? Like really get a lot of clarity around that because you need to own that change before you can explain it or persuade or whatever the word you might want to use is before you can, can be authentic with them as well. So I think being able to get a lot of clarity around there with some reflection and then be able to bring up the reasons why. The reason you want to change jobs is not because you want to make less money. That's usually not the reason, right? <laughs> the reason is because it's going to bring you something else. So I think being able to say, look, this is my personal experience and where I'm headed, and this is what I think might make a difference mm -hmm. um, and make it a conversation. Good luck okay, with you, nice. you know, to you on that one. I think it's, it's one of those really hard things to do that can have really, really wonderful results though. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, that's a great way to leave off. Uh, join me in thanking Emily for being here today and for providing all your wisdom and insight and really giving us some great tools to, to take away. Uh, before we conclude, I just want to encourage you to explore our newly launched Bruin Promise website. The Bruin Promise is an opportunity for Bruins like you to take advantage of the array of opportunities available at UCLA, sharing with you tools and resources that allow you to advance in your career and along different pathways throughout your lifetime. If you haven't taken a opportunity to complete our program feedback survey, please feel free to do that after the webinar concludes. You'll actually get a prompt uh, once the Zoom ends for you to complete that. And finally, if, you'd, if you're interested in hearing more about how to, you know, trans create transferable skills or transfer the skills that you have now into pivoting to a new career. We have our next webinar 
on March 16th called Seven Transferable Skills to Help You Thrive. Uh, so register today. Again, Emily, thank you for being here. Um, and uh, we hope you enjoyed this session. Go Bruins. Great. Thanks. Go Bruins.